The author Edgar Allan Poe died mysteriously on the streets of Baltimore City in 1849. He was laid to rest at Westminster Hall, and, and it's a place that you can still go today, uh, kind of adjacent to the west side of downtown, get good crab cakes, and, and go by and visit the grave. And, and about 90 years after Poe's death, uh, an interesting Baltimore tradition was set in. Uh, a person shrouded with a cloak and a hat would, would arrive on Poe's birthday to Westminster Hall and to, uh, to toast to the birth of uh, Edgar Allan Poe. They would, they would arrive with a bottle of cognac and a glass and some roses and, and would pour themselves some cognac and toast to Edgar Allan Poe before leaving the glass and the bottle and the roses there to sit, mysteriously disappearing as mysteriously as they arrived, never seeking any other attention or anything of that sort, really just trying to, to commemorate. And, and this continued on until 2009 when, when the Poe Toaster either decided that uh, 200 years was enough years to, to stop commemorating someone's birthday or they themselves succumb to death. The spirit of the Poe Toaster is rooted in commemoration, only this and nothing more. And it's this spirit that really would mark Mary Magdalene's approach to Jesus's grave in John 20, uh, a way to commemorate, to, to say goodbye, to put the pieces together for, for all that's been lost as, as the person that she chose to follow um, has been beaten, crucified, pierced in the side and locked behind a giant stone, crucified as an enemy of the state. She, she arrives on the scene in John 20, wondering aloud whether or not, according to Mark, she's even going to have someone there that would let the stone be rolled away so that she can finish the burial rites and, and to give a proper goodbye. The spirit with which she arrives is a spirit of commemoration and goodbye, but what she leaves with is a spirit of celebration because what she encounters is not just the commemoration of a dead of a dead teacher but the celebration of a risen savior and what we're invited to consider today is is whether or not we are celebrating and commemorating a risen savior who's planted resurrection hope in our hearts or if we're just leaving flowers at the grave, uh, another year to commemorate Easter where there's this guy that had some good things to say that's still dead. The invitation of John's gospel is to believe that, that resurrection hope is alive and well and available to us and to center our lives on that resurrection hope today. And so I want to invite us to consider a few things from John's gospel that are the implications of that belief. What does it mean for us to really believe it and embrace it? What's the invitation and the challenge behind it? The first is that to believe that Jesus is the king and not just a mascot or a prop to, to any lesser kingdom. When I say the phrase is king and kingdom, you might think of like going to medieval times. You might think of, of, of a Disney movie where there's like a, a princess and a talking snowman and, and singing birds that like are leading someone into a version of their best life where everyone lives happily ever after. But, but when I say king and when I say kingdom, which is Jesus's favorite topic, what he was really talking about is ushering in a system of beliefs and assumptions about how the world works. And as Mary arrives at the beginning of John chapter 20, her king Kingdom, her king has been shattered, and it appears that the kingship of Rome is predominant. That it appears like the worldview of the religious leaders that have succeeded in having Jesus put to death, where, where they can leverage Jesus to, to make themselves look externally good, is the prevailing way to think. That, that, th that those who would, um, would wave palm branches in a spirit of Maccabean revolt um, at Jesus of Nazareth and triumphal entry will exchange those things for the worldview of the insurrectionist of Jesus 
Barabbas, who they want to be freed in his stead. That the, the way in which the world appears to work on the Sunday morning that Mary is walking towards the grave in question is to say, hey, the way of Jesus is a passing fad. Take a few good things he had to say, but now you've got to figure out how to make those things work because these are the powers that be. It's Rome's greatness, the power of the sword, the religiosity of the religious leaders, Mary, Peter, John, all that are involved, you know, figure out what you can take because there's other powers at play. But if, but if what Mary says is true in John 18, that, uh, that she has seen and encountered the Lord, that Jesus is not dead, but is very much alive, not as just a ghost or an apparition, but as a living hope, then what it evidences is that all of these worldviews of nationalism and religiosity that have thrown their worst at Jesus and put him to death cannot, in fact, defeat his kingship and his kingdom. As the way Dr. Esau Macaulay says, the defeat of death is God's great triumph. It reshapes the Christian imagination, forever obliterating the limits we place upon the creator. We, more than we'd like to admit, are prone to be like Pontius Pilate, What's enough of Jesus just to kind of keep myself in good graces with my cultural um, forces that, that kind of leave me in a place of power? We tend to be like the chief priests. Like what's just enough of Jesus that I can sort of keep myself looking strong and externally good to the world around me? We tend to be like Jesus Barabbas. How do we leverage Jesus to actually kind of get our freedom to go and do the things we actually want to do? And, and you may not have the same ideologies of, of the Romans or the chief priests or of Jesus Barabbas, but there's a series of things you bring into how the world works that, that every Easter we're, we're challenged to just kind of take the words of Jesus or the, the Easter story and fit those things neatly and tidily into our best life. And if Jesus is dead... We can do what Baltimore did with Edgar Allan Poe, take his writings and, and name a football team after him. But if Jesus is alive, then he's not a footnote in this story. He is the triumphant king. And all of these forces that are, that are the winners of the, the beginning of John chapter 20 that have been dismantled have become footnotes to the story. And what you and I are being invited to believe is that the kingdom of God and the way of Jesus isn't something that, that neatly fits into our political ideologies or the, the influence your best life that we want to live, but rather we have an invitation this Easter and, and every day that follows to, to pursue a king that will disciple out of us the ways of thinking that have been discipled into us about how the world claims to work but cannot work in light of resurrection hope. So, so today is an opportunity to, to walk away from the political and cultural and social assumptions that news and influencers and families of origins and, and our feelings might say is the way to get to our best life. Because Jesus is not a prop to those things. He's a resurrected king. And his power is, 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 is leading us to a place where freedom is ultimately found. We're also invited to believe that the resurrection hope can meet us in the chaos and confusion of our moment. So take everything I just said for a minute. And if I say, hey, do you, do you believe it? What we might tend to do is, is kind of treat belief in the resurrection like a terms and conditions page, right? Uh, I'm going to scroll down through it all, check. I didn't really read it. I just want to get to the, I want to get to the good stuff. Or, oh crud, there's terms and conditions here. I don't want any of this business. That feels like a lot of commitment. Let me opt out or scroll out of this or X out of this as quickly as I can. This is how a lot of us fundamentally think of belief in the resurrection. What John says in John chapter 20, verse 31, is that the reason he would record any of this stuff to begin with, Mary's story, his story, any story, is that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. 
But it's a good reminder to us as we look through the precursors to those words in John 20 of what what, what belief really looks like. Resurrection hope arriving in the difficulties of chaos and confusion for everyone involved. Not just, a, not just a doctrine to absorb, not just a terms and conditions checkbox to acknowledge, but, but to, to receive resurrection hope in the middle of chaos. For, for Mary Magdalene, the chaos of wondering what any of going to prepare the body of for burial might mean for her. For Peter and John, beginning in verse 3 of, of John 20, um, the, the, trusting whether or not Mary's story checks out, as well as when they get there to the tomb and they see clothes neatly folded, wondering with the implications like, was he, was he taken? Like, if he's taken, why are the clothes neatly folded? Was he alive? If he's alive, why, what is going on here? And oh, by the way, if he's alive, like, we like wielded swords. We ran for the hills. We denied that we knowed him. We, like, like we are, like, what is going to happen to us? <laughs> for the disciples in John chapter 20, verse 19, that are holed up in a room, fearing for their life from the Jewish leaders. The implications to apply belief, to, to, to remove them from a place of paralyzing fear. From Thomas, who's, who's trying to wrestle with the metaphysics of the whole thing when Jesus appears to him and demands to, to be able to touch Jesus and to see the scars for himself before he proclaims, my Lord and my God. What do we see in John chapter 20 about belief? That, that resurrection hope is not climbing out of the, the, like all of the mess and the muck and the junk of our story, but allowing, allowing a resurrected savior to arrive there proximate to the mess of it. To encounter his breath. To encounter his presence. To encounter his comfort. To en- encounter his voice. You and I this year are not being invited just to receive resurrection hope as a, as a series of terms or conditions to enjoy or to close out of, but rather to ask ourselves for all of, really probably to receive Easter this year the way the, way, the way the disciples may have actually received it. You know, uh, COVID has taken so much from so many of us, and I can't I can't overstate that probably for you. But if it's given us anything, it's it's probably the capacity to process resurrection this year and last year the way the disciples would have. Not just as another stop point on a day of chocolate bunnies and Easter egg hunts and going to see family and packing up to get home from spring break. And, but, but rather, it, the middle of chaos and confusion, wondering whether or not resurrection hope is powerful enough to arrive, to arrive in our story. And, and so I, I just want to invite you to receive it this year in the middle of struggling to forgive or navigating strain in our relationships to um, in the middle of the transition to high school or to, to, to a new city, in the middle of working from home and the pressures you feel to, to do it all and have it all, to processing everything that's happened this year and the losses that you've dealt with, to, to the physical symptoms that you might feel, to the emotional or the mental health struggles that you might have as a result of this year, to, to the ways in which we've acted out unresolved Sourcefully in, in, in trying to cover up or to mask or to medicate our pain uh, with, with trying to navigate difficult relationships or starting a business. How does resurrection hope meet us right now in the middle of those things? What John's trying to get us to, to get to is that, is that resurrection hope isn't just you uh, turning off all the doubts, turning off all the pain, turning off all the grief and uncertainty, but so that, so that you can get to a place where you just go, I believe it. The Bible says it. It's true. Rather, it's inviting us to say resurrection shows up in the middle of chaos, confusion, uncertainty, unwinds those things, helps us to, to doubt our doubts, helps us to see where we can put our trust and who we can put our trust in and leads us and walks us to a place of life. That, that, that that's the essence of faith and belief this year. 
not just checking the box because 15 years ago we said, ah, I think I buy in. Lastly, to believe that our role is not just commemoration, but pronouncement. John chapter 20, verse 21 helps us here. Jesus walks into this room where the door is locked. He says, peace be with you. He shows them his hands. He shows them his side. The disciples are overjoyed when they see him. And again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the father has sent me, I am sending you. When Jesus walks into this room, he does something that, that your, your mom or a teacher or a coach maybe would have done differently, right? Um, if I'm Jesus, if you're Jesus, if your coach is Jesus, if your mom's Jesus, flipping over tables, screaming, I can't believe you guys. What, can you believe, what, what's wrong with you? I told you guys. Like, go, did you see all the times they said three days, three days, three days? How could you be so dumb? Jesus doesn't walk in going, okay, let's talk with you, Peter. Okay, now let's deal with you, John. And just rattling off the mistakes, he breathes on them and he sends them on mission. What's this pointing to? <laughs> that the way in which his resurrection hope is to be experienced is, is, is not just in the beating ourselves up for all the wrong things that we've done and all of the ways in which uh, we, we didn't measure up to doing the things Jesus told us to do, but to receive the breath of forgiveness and grace in our lungs and to know that God wants to use even those things to proclaim a glorious and wonderful resurrection hope. I mean, this is the essence of Mary Magdalene's story because, because there's, like, she's, she struggles with her mental health. She, she struggles with her, her, the, the implications of a painful past. She's a woman living in the first century. There's, there's no shortage of reasons why she should be disqualified from, from doing anything other than, okay, Jesus, you're back. Like, I'll hold the flowers. I'll serve the, the, the coffee or, or whatever, you know, the first century socializing drink of choice would be. But what Jesus does instead is to breathe his spirit into these disciples and to empower them to be the proclaimers of this mission and this resurrection hope. God wants to use you to tell this story. What we're not called to do is just to sort of commemorate it and go, okay, well, until next year, but to pronounce it. And this is what it means to be the church, what it means to be people of the resurrection, to be people who don't just excel at holding sermons and singing songs about whether or not we believe the resurrection to be true, but to embody as the father has sent Jesus, to, to receive that spirit and to live out that mission of, of this triumphant kingdom of God, carrying itself out and loving our neighbors, serving humbly, washing the feet of others. Does, does this, do, do we remember this? <laughs> Do, do we wrap our minds around this? You know, you know, this year has been so disjointed in terms of our gatherings. And, and as I'm so, so grateful for all of the ways in which our production team and our digital ministry team has, has pivoted and excelled at trying to, to make this celebration accessible. But, but as we move through this year and we continue to excel in that space and we continue to figure out what a hybrid gathering strategy looks like, there's a danger. The danger is this, that we just begin to think that the whole business of the church is to put together songs and sermons on Sunday and consume them. But our goal is not just commemoration. It's it's celebration and pronunciation, which means we live in a spirit of sending. That as we gather and we remember online, in person, we remember that some of the best work God wants to do in your life is in the scattering and the sending this year. In the places where God has called you to live out resurrection hope. Today, we don't gather as mourners clad in black, trying to remember one or two of the pithy sayings of our Savior. We are people coming together, wrestling with and celebrating these things um, in, the, in the presence of a greater hope. 
we do so with a God who's willing to breathe on us. And at a time when the breath of others is, is toxic and to be feared and to, to mask or when, when our breath can be toxic to others, we consider the breath of a resurrected Savior that cleanses and transforms the disciples' story, that refreshes those who are wrestling with the implications of resurrection where they are, and empowering this ragtag group of people with gifts and passions and story to, to live and pronounce a greater kingdom. May you receive that breath in your lungs today. In the name of Jesus, our risen hope. Amen.